but we're going to basically use this time to uh, give you guys a taste of what's going on around uh, Western New York and things that you can do in your own lives and ways that you can tap into what's going on uh, in your community to, uh, to make changes and to, um, to think about solutions. And the idea here is for you to use this discussion, these presentations, to uh, get ready for our breakout discussions. So once this panel uh, presents, then we are going to ha disperse our speakers out to the tables and ask you to go and sit with the one that interested you the most so you can be involved in that kind of conversation. Um, and uh, we'll have some time to really dig into uh, questions uh, and just sort of a group discussion around your table about what you've heard today. So without further ado, we're going to start with Derek Bird from the Environmental Justice Action Group of Western New York is going to talk about their experience cleaning up the, getting the East uh, Ferry Street site cleaned up. Thank you very much. We like to use the word remediation rather than just clean up because that <laughs> doesn't say very much for folks. Well, first of all, I would say thanks for the invitation uh, to this meeting, and I would like to recognize the presence of uh, two of our board members, the Environmental Justice Action Group, uh, David Hunt Baker, as well as Christine uh, Mariki Sizioni. Is that close? Good enough? All right, very good, thank you. All right, um, this uh, project was at 858 East Ferry, kind of goes back to uh, 1980, we had a person by the name of Betty Jean Grant, who now is uh, with the um, Erie County Legislature. And she was operating a store in the area and noticed that a number of people were coming in complaining of illness and that sort of thing. So she decided that she would uh, <clears throat> But I tried to find out what was happening. thought there might have been something uh, wrong in the water. And she would call down the city hall and go down to try to find out. They told her there was nothing wrong. So she decided that the best way to find out what was in the city records is to become a city, uh, a member of the city council and see for herself. Well, she tried the first time and lost and then went back again and won, and found out that there was some very interesting activity. But that led us then uh, to the, um, uh, the, the determination that we probably thought that there might be some connection between lupus, the reason that people were getting sick, and uh, some things that were happening right there at the intersection of um, East Ferry and Grinder. And that was a plant uh, that had been in business as a copper smelting and zinc plant uh, for about 50 years, went out of business in 1978. Well, okay, I, I don't have time to take 20 years worth of history and bring it into five years, but I'm trying as fast. In fact, I will be speaking <clears throat> hopefully as fast as some of the commercials that you hear on radio. You know, the one you look at, and you wonder, what is that all about? Um, but I'm going to you know what I'm saying? It's wrong with it. Okay, all right. So anyway, connecting to that, so Betty Jean sort of did that. A woman, okay. I, I think that's what I'm doing, bringing, to let you know how she brought us and led us uh, to the point. All right. Secondly, uh, we needed to find someone, and I shouldn't say needed to find. We did need to find, but the Lord provided us. You like that? <laughs> That's all right. The Lord provided us with someone with whom we could personify the movement. We had a group known as the Toxic Waste Lupus Coalition, and so what we what we need. Oh my goodness! Thank you. What will I do with that? Okay. Uh, so we uh, did find and and were introduced to a woman, and I would need to stop and say Judy 
Anderson, who has been the driving force to keep us on target with this. And she would deny it if you asked her, but I was there the whole time, so I know what she contributed. So she was sort of like the <coughs> staff person that was laying out steps for us to follow. And then there was another person who was also a lupus sufferer, uh, who uh, 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 Rhonda Jean Dixon, uh, Dixon I guess she's Moss now, uh, she became the president. So with them we had leadership provided by those folks who were really persons with lupus, rather than those of us trying to identify and, you know, try to lay claim to this. So that made it uh, really real for us. Okay. can tell you, over the 20 years, uh, 27 years that we worked from beginning to end, uh, the group changed about three times. You know, you, you maintain a core group, we lost a peripheral group, but uh, <coughs> over time we discovered that there was that that that, that <laughs> <done. laughs> <laughs> Well uh, the project ended uh, successfully, uh -huh. uh, okay, uh, with a uh, $9.7 million remediation program that was authorized and done through the Department of, of uh, Environmental Conservation uh, on that corner so that we now are able to use that property for housing and it so happens that one of our partners, the Sue Bethel Baptist Church, will be using that as a housing, uh, as a, as a lot for, a land for uh, housing for senior citizens and a community center. Okay? All right. Uh, what I wanted to say uh, before that, one of the important things is to have a chronicler, okay? Somebody who's not taking the walk with you, but writing down what you're doing. So it happens again that the Lord sent to us a person who has written this book. This is what it looks like. It's called The Autoimmune Epidemic, and uh, her name is uh, Donna Jackson Nakasawa, and uh, devoted about 50 pages to the act activity at 858. So if you uh, didn't get enough information from the time that I have available, it's in the book. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. All right, so now we're going to hear from Blake Sylvester, who's a licensed cosmetician, and she's going to talk a little bit about personal care products. Thank you, Bobby. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Blaise Sylvester, and I'm a success story. <laughs> Growing up in St. Lucia was very interesting. Didn't quite see that at the time, but I see that now. Uh, with all the choices we have to make every day regarding our health and well-being, from the foods we eat to the products we use, I must say I have been blessed to grow up in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. My grandmother taught me that the field, herbs in the field were my food and my medicine. The challenges we face today while making decisions about the products we use are never easy, but there is always a choice. A healthier path to accomplish the results we want to a better quality of life. The choice is always yours. I created I'm a success story as a result of those principles. When you decide whose target market you want to be, then, and only then, will the manufacturers stop doing business as usual. <clears throat> By choosing to use and promote products that are natural and safe, not only to my body, but to my being, I'm caring for my world. I'm sorry. 
I work with <laughs> I work with Aubrey Organics and Walida products simply because they are great products with natural and organic organic ingredients. Aubrey was founded in 19, 1967. Today, Aubrey Organics has remained a pioneer in the natural and organic personal care industry. In 1994, the company became the first personal care manufacturer to be certified as an organic processor. Aubrey has created a natural ingredients dictionary, and I do have some on the table to my left, which lists all ingredients used in their products. Page 48 contains a list of 10 synthetic cosmetic ingredients to avoid. So everyone should go home with one of those books. Aubrey used only the finest herbal plants, extracts, and natural vitamins in all their products. You will find no paraf paraben preservatives, no petrochemicals, no artificial col color or fragrances of any kind. Today, Aubrey remains committed to making healthy products based on herbal traditions that in many cases date back thousands of years. Willita Products was created 90 years ago in Germany, an all-natural product company stemming from the teachings of an of philosopher, Dr. Rudolf Stein. His, and he encourages the individual to see his or her body, mind and spirit as linked to the, our world, all parts of one holistic system. <clears throat> Wulida has very clear standards for their products. No synthetic preservatives, no synthetic fragrances, no synthetic chemicals, no synthetic anything. Wulida uses a base product as its main ingredient use it and uses complementary herbs, roots, extracts to create products that will support the body through its own natural healing process. For example, one of my favorite products from Walida is the pomegranate. Firming cream, night cream, day cream, <laughs> body lotion, pomegranate. The base ingredient is pomegranate. I am so grateful for the companies such as these two examples that I have shared with you. As you have made it as they have made it their life's mission to produce products that are not only safe for humans, but for the world at large. In closing, I would like to thank Clean and Health in New York, Bobby Chase Wilding, for inviting me here today and for you and you for hearing me. I encourage you to choose your products wisely. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Sarah Bishop from Buffalo First. Well, I feel like I got to stand up. My organizing spirit is, is in me, right? So uh, we're going to bring the energy up a little bit right now. And uh, just want to thank you all uh, for being here and for Bobby for inviting me. Uh, and I think that parlays very nicely what you just said, because uh, what we do at Buffalo First is to create a local living economy. And so we believe in a holistic approach to that, and uh, we believe um, that all of these things are in concentric circles, so we can't solve one problem without solving them all, right? And so we believe that we don't do things in silos, and that localism is a powerful economic and community tool, um, but also it's addressing all the health and wellness that we're speaking about today. So Buffalo First does a lot of advocacy and a lot of edu education and uh, talking to elected officials about how you can get involved in your community. How easy it is to shift your, your dollars to local businesses, to have a say in your community, to keep that money here, to build a thriving economy, um, and, and also to build businesses um, like Linda was alluding to, that we are not anti-business because we say that you should do the right thing, right? That you should take care of our health and well-being. And so we talk about the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit, and how that creates a more sustainable uh, environment for all of us to live, work, and play in. Um, and I know that Rebecca's going to talk all about that, so I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, <laughs> 
But I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Uh, basically, that is, you know, in a nutshell, what Buffalo First uh, does on a daily basis. I encourage you all to be active participants. Get out there, like Linda said, organize, join uh, organizations like Buffalo First, like Clean Air Coalition, all those that are on the front lines each and every day. Uh, this is your environment, this is your community, and you have a say. Thank you. So Kate McCardle is next. She's got a PowerPoint briefly. She's going to talk about eco healthy child care. Thank you. And Sarah, on that active yes. note, um, <laughs> I spend a lot of time working in educating children, but also um, educating adults. And I'm going to ask you all to stand up because you learn uh, there's a, stis a statistic out there that you're going to learn. 18% better if you're standing. So maybe you'll remember what I'm saying if you're standing. Um, there you go, get the blood moving. Um, Eco Healthy Child Care is a national program. It started out in Oregon, as many wonderful things do, um, but it is now a national program through the Children's Environmental Health Network. Um, I do have a little binder of all the material, which I will share in my group later, of all the great uh, downloads that you can get on their site, uh, which is at the end of this. Um, uh, PowerPoint, if you do not have uh, internet access, uh, please see me afterwards because all of the information is online um, or I can get it to you. But this national program is fantastic in that it takes a curriculum for child care providers. As you heard this morning and um, as you'll hear in the afternoon sessions, um, we, all, we are always talking about women and children and how these certain chemicals are affecting our, our children. Um, very specifically. Um, I'm going to take a break. You guys can sit down if you really want to. I see, some of you are already eyeing the <laughs> So they're affecting our children. Um, this curriculum, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, the goal is obviously to protect children, um, but also their caregivers. Um, later um, in the PowerPoint, we see that 98% of caregivers uh, that are registered and licensed in New York State are women. Um, there's obvious reasons for that, but there's 98% of our women are, are providing this essential um, gift and um, they're spending all day sometimes in Western New York um, inside of um, these, what we're finding, uh, toxic environments. So we try to protect the child, um, but also their caregiver and offer free or low cost solutions. Many of the uh, speakers this morning were talking about the very, they might have thrown out some of the simple things that we can do. like not microwaving plastic, not using saran wrap. Um, Kate was talking about, you know, airing out her furniture before she put her, her infant child in. Uh, in. There are some simple things that we can provide to our caregivers and also to the parents. Um, and uh, when, you know, you're picking up your child at daycare, wouldn't it be great to get one little quick fact that you could bring home with you? So we're really trying to focus on those free and low cost solutions, provide resources and um, more technical assistance. So. Um, what my organization does, which is called the Child Care Council, I'm not sure if it's the next slide or not, but no, it's not. You can go to the next, eh, don't worry about the slide, it's fine. <laughs> what, what, uh, what, do we, what we do, the Child Care Council is a resource and referral agency. Basically, we are um, responsible for educating child care providers, but also registering them and offering them technical assistance. So uh, what's fantastic is through the Child Care Council, we have this great network in New York State um, to get out to all the child care providers um, within New York State. And we're lucky enough to be partnering uh, with Clean and Healthy New York and uh, for the next two years um, and really hit uh, those child care providers in the program um, that we're working on now. Um, I would like just to, to note um, the training areas behind me you see. Um, those are the 11 topic areas that we focus on, but um, obviously there's a, a lot more um, that goes on within uh, the training for New York State. We're going to make it um, New York State specific on this project, which means that there will be um, eight specific data sheets and curriculum that is New York State specific when we're going out to both the organizations like mine, the Child Care Council, and when we're training the providers, but also when we're training um, uh, the, the trainers of the providers. So keep going. I just want to make sure I hit everything else. The one other statistic when preparing for today, one of the things I found was the number of women that are out there looking um, for child care, child care um, in New York State. Look at that. It's one million. They don't have any numbers, uh, or I couldn't find any of the men that were out there searching for child care. Do you know of any men that are out there searching for child care? 
We don't care about those numbers, but I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Couldn't find them. But uh, one million, um, over one million women in New York State are searching for that child care. And wouldn't it be fantastic if we could get all of this information to all of those um, women and men uh, that are out there looking for uh, healthy child care? So I think that's it. Wrap up. Um, uh, I can talk about this in the in the groups. Um, basically, there's a list that would uh, the child care pro provider would have to comply with. Um, nationally and then both for our project as well um, and you can cut it there that's that's all it is thank you all right so now we're going to hear from Roxanne Button who is an architect and talk about the built environment thank you I feel like I had to stand up now so the focus of my work has been for 20 years um, building greener, healthier projects. And there are a number of green initiatives that are happening in the building industry that are going to start filtering down and affecting, um, as they get this set, uh, affecting the built environment. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Up. The timer's not going yet. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just get to the, go real quick to the first few slides. So, we spend an average of 90% of our time inside buildings. So, there's obviously going to be an impact on our health. How we, there's it, there it is, the big 90%. Um, so, how we build and what we build with um, has really changed. Just go through the um, Materials used to be natural, uh, more naturally derived, like brick, stone, wood. Since the Second World War, we have a lot more composite, synthetic materials. We're using a lot more chemicals. We have insulation that is made up of nothing but chemicals. So what we're putting into our buildings uh, can be quite uh, hazardous to our health. Uh, next. I need to go one more just to get ahead. Thanks. Uh, so our buildings are also becoming tighter because we are making them more energy efficient. So what we're doing is we're building these tightly sealed boxes and we're putting more and more stuff inside these boxes that uh, can compromise the indoor air quality and also uh, consequently our health. And new building materials give off volatile organic compounds, VOCs. You know what new car smell is? There's new building smell too and it's not good for you. And these are things that we need to learn about and become uh, more aware of. Next slide. So one of the biggest things that's come out in the last 10 years that I've seen in the building industry is the advent of the LEED Green Building Rating System. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It was created by the U.S. Green Building Council 12 years ago, and it's, a, uh, it's kind of like a nutritional label for buildings. It's a way of, for us to measure how green our buildings are. And you recognize probably some of these buildings. These are some of the two dozen LEED certified buildings in western New York. And um, the way the system works is that the project is assessed against a list of criteria. Uh, it gathers points, and the points determine what rating the building gets, certified silver, gold, or platinum. There are eight categories in LEED. And the most important one for uh, our health is this one, indoor environmental quality. Under this category, we deal with specifically the materials that are inside our building. So we're looking for low VOC products. We are uh, telling construction workers that you're not allowed to smoke on the building site. And we're eliminating smoking, complete, smoking completely from our buildings. So these are just some of the things that this category covers. LEED is a standard that's always evolving. And uh, the next version of LEED is under development right now. And there are going to be even more important health-related issues covered in the next version of LEED that's going to be coming out next year. And just, just go with one, two more, and that's it. So there are a number of programs that um, certify products that go into our buildings and also certify buildings based only on indoor air quality. These are some of them. I just want to point out two that in particular are delving deeper into the chemical makeup and the, the contents of some of these building materials. On the, uh, on the upper right, the system called Pharos. This is an online searchable library of materials that architects can use to help select products for, for projects. Um, it's scored by <coughs> VOC content and toxins, 
and it screens against over 40 different lists of hazardous products. So it's a really important um, but highly technical tool for the building industry to start using to screen out the really bad stuff. On the bottom, you see um, health product declarations. This is a new system that's just coming out. It's uh, basically a disclosure document for manufacturers, so they list what's in their products. And believe it or not, a lot of companies are signing on to use this. Um, they really want to open up what they're doing, and they want to do better things, so that's great. And this tool is going to be used in the next version of LEED. Uh, so this is just the beginning. Where do we go from here to, to get better materials for our buildings? I, I look at the living building challenge as kind of the next generation of green buildings. And uh, this is where LEED gives us a kind of a menu of things to choose from. The living building challenge has 20 required things that you have to do uh, in buildings. And the uh, only three buildings have been certified so far. It's the most stringent system that we have. Um, <coughs> one more. Okay, this is what I want to get to. So this is the most important thing under the Living Building Challenge. Uh, this is called the Red List. And it's a list of 14 chemicals and products that are not allowed in these buildings. It's a really important list. I can't even pronounce some of these things. I'm sorry Diana's not here because she can tell us what these are. But these are just rampant in building materials. So this is why this is such an important thing in the building industry to start to identify the specific products that we need to start to get rid of. Um, because it's really difficult to find products that do not contain these chemicals, um, the Living Building Challenge is going to give a temporary exception for buildings that are going through their process. But that's going to change as we gradually become, uh, we get better products that don't have these things in them. And this says a lot about where we are in the building industry and where we need to go. And just go to the last slide. These are some of the Living Building Challenge projects, three that are certified. So the Red List and the Living Building Challenge are where I see the green building industry, the entire building industry going. It's really important that we become more knowledgeable about what goes into our buildings and what we don't want in our buildings. And that's really where we need to go as an industry. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. How you guys all doing? Two more, and then we're going to break out. The next one is Rebecca Newberry from Clean Air Coalition. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me today. My name is Rebecca Newberry. I'm staff at the Clean uh, Air Co Coalition of Western New York. And we began about six years ago, uh, literally from residents in Tonawanda, New York, who noticed there was a lot of health problems uh, in their neighborhood. So they met around the kitchen tables, got together, and thought that the, the problems they were seeing, the high incidences of leukemia, uh, breast cancer, asthma, respiratory illnesses, were tied to the 53 industrial facilities uh, in their neighborhood. So they got together, they organized, uh, and six years later, we have a three person staff, full-time staff, uh, and we have a membership base of over 100 folks that live throughout Tonawanda, New York, and parts of the city of Buffalo. So we build power by developing grassroots leaders who run and win environmental uh, win campaigns that advance environmental justice and public health in western New York. Uh, and so we do this in one of three, well, three ways, right? We run campaigns against companies and agencies and authorities that perpetuate environmental injustice. And the photo there actually was taken, it was a recent rally we had uh, outside the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, one of the plants that we've targeted in the past, Tonawanda Coke, does that company familiar? Okay, awesome. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know, you know, the audience. So uh, their operating permit actually has been extended uh, for about five years, so they're running on an extended permit. So uh, a bunch of the residents, we, we gathered outside the DC, you know, office to say, you know, that's not good enough. And the changes that they've been making at that facility need to be incorporated into their Title V operating permit. We develop grassroots resident leaders. So we run a seven-month program called the Lois Gibbs Fellowship. Uh, Natasha at the table back there, I don't know if you want to raise your hand. If folks uh, are interested in that program, we do workshops every month, uh, training everybody in how, you know, how to talk to media, how to run a campaign, how to lobby an elected official. So if folks are interested in that program, it is free. They'll probably ask you for money at the end, but it is free, so just go and see Natasha about that. And we facilitate resident-based research and share results with communities. So we actually train residents on how to take their own air samples. Uh, some of the original samples that were taken 
pointed the finger at Tonawanda Coke, uh, the facility in Tonawanda that was emitting benzene extremely over the uh, level of EPA standards. And for folks that don't know, benzene is a known carcinogen, so it's tied to cancers like leukemia. And because of those original bucket samples and the, um, the public pressure that residents did, the, the EPA did lead an enforcement action on that plant. The environmental control manager was let out in cuffs you know, by the EPA and by the US Coast Guard and now is facing about 20 uh, violations, um, federal violations. So, you know, communities can get together and when they organize, they win. Um, so we're excited, it was a huge win for us. Okay, so I'm just gonna, real briefly, <laughs> so I don't get the evil eye. Um, we, have, we have about four organizing areas. Uh, one of our organizing areas is that the environmental health is used in Tonawanda, New York, which I talked a little bit about. Uh, in addition to Tonawanda Coke this past summer, we were successful in shutting down a crematory that was located in residents' backyards, the Amagons. Folks from Buffalo know the name? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they were literally located right next door to a family uh, in a pretty dense neighborhood outside of Sheridan Drive in Tonawanda. So what we do know is that crematories are a source of mercury, a source of uh, lead emissions, and not to mention a horrible smell. I mean, when you burn bodies, it doesn't smell great. So we were successful in shutting down that facility and pressuring that facility to relocate. We also work in um, four neighborhoods, Lackawanna, the east side, uh, it's North Buffalo, and I'm forgetting, two, two neighborhoods on the east side, around uh, first student buses. Uh, they're located right next to, um, again, people. And we do know, know that diesel exhausts are, uh, cause asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Let's keep going. And we do have another campaign looking at, um, do folks remember the Niagara Loop conspire last summer yeah. over in Black Rock? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 That huge fire. Yeah. You can kind of see some photos. So we've been working with residents in that neighborhood to look at the emergency response by uh, the city and the county uh, to basically evacuate people when emergencies like that happen. The issue with the fire was folks who live there were stuck there and they wouldn't let them leave. So we had a lot of babies that went to the hospital uh, going into cardiac arrest, um, coughing up blood, and there really wasn't a good response from the community about how to deal with that in the case when a lubricant fire or any industry really catches on fire or there's an emergency related to that. So. And then on the west side, we work with residents around the bridge. Um, our folks, does anyone live on the west side of Buffalo? Hands? Yeah, okay, all right. So folks that live on the west side, Rebecca, can you actually raise your hand one more time? This is Ms. Soto, go see her. <laughs> she will give you all the details about all the amazing work on the west side. Uh, but in short, about 4,000 diesel trucks run through that neighborhood per day. We've got four times the asthma rate than anywhere else in the city. Uh, and much over the national uh, average. So the wins here are we've gotten the Common Council to adapt an environmental justice um, policy uh, resolution for the west side of Buffalo to take concerns people's health, moving forward with Peace Bridge Plaza expansions, and we've also gotten two air monitors up and running uh, in September to actually measure the levels of particulates in that neighborhood. So this is what we do, right? We, we fight for policies that protect people's health. We have a saying, you know, it, it's our problem, but it's not our fault, okay? We need people, we need policies and people in power to protect us. We develop grassroots residence leaders, and we develop an evidence base, okay? That's all, that's my, yeah. kind of my all right. And so to wrap things up, we're gonna hear from Anya Williamson to look a little bit more about the work that P2I is doing. Thanks. Okay, so I want to make sure we get to the discussion part of this. So just very briefly, um, again, the Pollution Prevention Institute was formed actually before I had the opportunity to lead it. Um, it took many years for it to get through the legislation. It was a very uh, proactive thinking program. It took a lot of brilliant people to put it together, Bobby being one of them, Beth Meir um, at DEC, who actually wrote a white paper that the state of New York needs this type of resource. So it went through the legislation, it came out. We're still a young institute. Um, this is our fifth year. And we actually found out that through a sole source contract, we'll get another five years. Um, and I think that's, that's a great opportunity for us to address some of the, the issues that we're talking about today. What makes us unique is that we are a technical resource um, and we have the opportunity to focus on pollution prevention. And that really is not pollution control. 
which oftentimes people mistake that for. It's not focusing on the end of pipe and compliance and regulations. We do have regulators to, to try to do that. It's really focusing more on being proactive. How do you reduce waste at the source? How do you design better for the environment? How do you incorporate sustainability and that triple bottom line that Sarah mentioned? How do you live in better communities? How do you integrate the community into what you're doing? So we have programs that support academic research that's applied. All the research, go, the results of the research really have an impact on New York State communities or industries. We have, a, we have our engineers that actually go out and work with companies throughout New York State to help them become more efficient and reduce their footprint. And we support communities, communities um, not-for-profit organizations. We have a community grants program. We just received 35 uh, applications to that this year. And we wish we had more funding so we could support all of them. But some excellent work being done in the state of New York when it comes to sustainability and pollution prevention. So we have a great straight state. We have great infrastructure. We have some serious concerns. But we have good people that are all trying to address them. So OK, with that, thank you. that uh, has come up sort of as a theme that I just want to let folks know about that's not necessarily based here in Western New York, but uh, Clean and Healthy New York and a lot of organizations are also part of campaigns to target companies to get them to change. So for example, the Breast Cancer Fund succeeded in getting Campbell's to make a commitment to get out of bisphenol A in their food can linings. Um, they're now targeting Progresso. Those kinds of campaigns work. Uh, earlier this year, Graco announced that they were going to stop using halogenated flame retardants in their baby car seats. So those kinds of victories are also occurring uh, on the national level. Um, and so there are many, many other ways that you can make a difference. Uh,